I am so excited to be here with you. But when I heard that the theme was knowing, I immediately thought, my children should give a presentation. It would be fantastic. They know everything. <laughs> I mean everything. Ask them, they'll tell you. But as I was thinking about that, I realized how much I used to know. I don't seem to know very much anymore. And I went to college for a long time. The bad news, I'm still paying student loans. <laughs> how could this possibly happen? And like any scientist confronted with some deep, emotional, personal issue, I had to graph the data. <laughs> I like to call this the knowing curve. There's a lot of curves out there. This is the knowing one. And if you take a look at this, this is my life. A little bit of a slow start, but by the time I was in my teens, I was amazing. But by the time I got in my 20s, things started to go badly for me. And my knowing just capitulated into now. I know very little. And I want to talk to you about this moment. It was a brief moment. That I, I, don't laugh that hard. That I thought I knew something, and it turns out that I didn't. And the idea I want to share with you today, which has been something that's really shaped my life, is that knowledge, degrees, university, training, classes, it's not the same as knowing, being intimately connected to life in some particular space or time. And I'm going to tell you a story where I learned this, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do so you can get the context of the story. Now, my work over the last 20 years is focused on trying to understand the way in which animals, both wild and domestic, and people interact in the environment and the way that climate might change this. My focus has been on trying to understand how diseases move from humans to animals and from animals to humans. We are rapidly changing our world in ways that we can't begin to imagine with consequences that are completely uncertain. But these changes are not only in transformed landscapes where you live and you work. They're in our protected areas, in the remotest areas, where people go for tourism and various other activities. And I would argue that there are no wild places left and that we have changed our world profoundly in every corner. Now, my work has focused on water because of all things, we're changing water rapidly. And of all things, that's what we need. Now, most of you will never have contact with an elephant. At least, I hope not. But you will have contact with wild animals indirectly through water. Water connects us all. It connects all of us. It connects all the animals in our environment. It, it connects all of our landscapes. And what we do to water affects us, affects the animals, and affects, in turn, the ecosystems on which we depend. Now, our work has indicated that these changes are profound, dramatic, and far-reaching. Antibiotic resistance is a signature for microorganisms that have originated from humans. And we're finding that animals deep in national parks have antibiotic resistance, like hyenas, buffalo, hippo. Some of the mongoose I work with are resistant to eight out of 10 antibiotics that we've tested. That's in a national park. It's an amazing consequence. It's an amazing problem. But in these same areas, people have recurrent diarrheal disease. And it is an impact mostly on children who die. So I've been trying to understand what is the linkage here? What can we do about it? Now this picture might be a little obscure and it's probably not very pretty. But let me explain what this is. If you see the little brown balls, that's elephant dung. And I'm not sure a lot of you would know what the little white bits are, but that's toilet paper, where people are using the toilet in the same place that animals are. And this road's right next to the river. So if it rains or it floods, this is going to go into the river. And I've been impressed with the potential for this to be a primary mechanism for humans and animals to share their pathogens. Because sanitation globally remains a challenge and a barrier. It's something that we take for granted, but others find a luxury. And indeed, in many places, you have to pay to use the toilet. Now, here you could pay two pulas to use the toilet, or you can pay five pulas and buy a loaf of bread. So if you're poor, 
you're unlikely to choose the luxury, and indeed it is, to use the toilet. You'll buy food instead. But how do you find out about this? I mean, we're even uncomfortable right now saying the word toilet. We say bathroom, right? Because toilet is a difficult word. People don't like to discuss it. They certainly are uncomfortable discussing that they don't have access. So how do you do it in a way that's sensitive and gracious, but yet truthful, so that you understand that you're getting the right information? What, if you look at this house here, you can tell that there isn't plumbing, that there is no pit latrine. And people are using the bush behind there for their needs. But in this compound where I work, it's a lot more difficult to tell whether or not they have what we call a pit latrine, a long drop, an outhouse, same sort of thing. And you either have to go and ask them and they maybe don't tell you the truth, or they're offended by it and then they don't talk to you. So how do you get around this? Because it's very important to understand it. So what I do is I tag this on to my interviews. I went to 90 households, and we were talking about different aspects of the way people use the environment and diarrhea and how people get sick. And then I ask if I can use the toilet. I have seen so many pit latrines, I am a connoisseur. <laughs> and so people either tell me, yes, you can use it, or no, I don't have one, or it's full and you can't use it. So then I get my information, and that's where my story comes in. So I was sitting with this amazing lady. She was uh, elderly. We were sitting on plastic buckets and chairs and broken chairs. It's amazing how people hang on to things and make them useful. And um, I got to the end of our interview, and I said, can I use the toilet? And she says, oh, of course. I mean, she was incredibly gracious. She grabs my hand and hurries me across the yard. I think she thought I was going to burst or something. And she said, no, no, don't worry. And I, she said, I don't actually have a toilet you can use because mine is full. And I said, well, oh, that's great. And she said, no, no, don't worry. We can go to my neighbor's. We can use a neighbor's pit latrine. And I thought, oh, no, kill me now. I do not want to see another pit latrine that I don't have to see. So she said, no, 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 I really, you know, don't worry. And she dashes off. She gets the neighbor. And the neighbor comes out, and they both lead me over to the pit latrine. And now I realize that I have to fake peeing. <laughs> I've faked a lot of things, but peeing is not one of them. <laughs> And so I have to climb up into the pit latrine, and there I am. I'm going to close the door now, and then I just have to wait. But there was no door. It was a burlap sack, and it goes right to my knees. So you can see my legs, and I can see their legs, and they're watching to make sure everything works out okay. So now I think, oh, my goodness, well, I, I have to now, I have to really try to do this. And what do you do when you're peeing? I mean, how many of you have thought of this? Well, I, I have to put my feet slightly apart, right? And you have to crouch down just a bit, right, because you're peeing. And then, well, wait a minute, but your pants have to be kind of down. And then you're trying not to fall in that big hole behind you, which has stuff, or out the front where everybody's standing watching you. And while I was doing all of this and having a bit of a panic attack, I notice that my pants are sitting in water. Now, in a bathroom, that's not a good thing normally. And you're thinking, somebody's missed. It's usually a male. But, <laughs> but in this case, it was everywhere. And I thought, well, this is amazing. So I got out, and I asked her, why is it so wet in there? And she sat me down, and she told me what she knew. And that is that wastewater, bath water, laundry water, uh, Dishwater is enormous, and there's nowhere to discard it. If you throw it on the ground, your children are exposed to it. It draws flies. It stinks. You live too close to people to throw it somewhere else because it's someone else's yard. So what do you do with it? They had been told to dump it in the pit latrine. Now, why is that important? Because having so much water go down a pit latrine makes it like a septic tank. And the chance that you're contaminating groundwater and even contaminating surface water in those pit latrines that are close by is big, and it's real. And I missed it. I didn't know this. I couldn't have gone to any conference. I couldn't have got yet another degree. I couldn't have taken a class, and I couldn't have talked to any of my colleagues to find this out. I had to talk to this lady who doesn't attend a university, who knew more than I'll ever know about the problem here. Socrates said that the only true wisdom is knowing you know nothing. I've worked for 20 years in Africa, and almost each and every day, I'm reminded how little I know. I'm humbled by it, deeply humbled, and sometimes I'm afraid. In our society, we value knowledge so much. We are so proud of our technological advances, our skill, our industry, and we believe with all of that that we really know what's important, and we don't. 
I've learned that you need to value knowing, that you need to respect knowing as much as you do knowledge, maybe more. It's been fundamental to some of the things that I've discovered. I would have not been asking the right questions if I hadn't learned what she knew. You know, increasingly, we are besieged with very complex problems that involve complex landscapes, different people, different ideas, and a convergence of different challenges. I think we need to reach beyond knowledge and take more time to learn from people who know what's important. I think it's worth our time. Thank you.